Thank you, Stacy. A beautiful song, beautifully done. And maybe somebody here or somebody watching is suffering right now, or you have made a great sacrifice. That song tells you what it's really all about. Let's talk about the cross this morning from Matthew chapter 27. If you'll turn there, the entire chapter is about the uh, trials of Jesus and then his crucifixion. We're going to pick it up at chapter 27, beginning at verse 32. So have your Bibles out, or your iPads, or phones, or whatever is available to you. There's a pew Bible in the pew rack in front of you. You can use that one. Chapter 27, verse 32. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right hand and the other on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it up in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priest and teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't seem to save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and then we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone, and let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. This is God's word for us today. Thanks be to God. You know the Christmas story, and so you know that the day that Jesus was born, that night the sky was made as bright as the 4th of July or noontime. But then the day that he died, the afternoon sky at noontime turned to darkness. Something was going on. This, of course, is the most important event, the, the events of that weekend, his crucifixion, and then what happened after that. Really the core of our gospel and really the core of all human history. Nothing has ever happened more important than this. And every one of the gospels records it, but they all tell it a little differently. They include this or exclude that. We have to read all of them to get the story. And Matthew's account, seems to me to be the strangest one of all. Some things, some weird things happened. It was at the end, what I just finished reading. The, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. There was an earthquake, the ground shook, and then the scripture says, uh, the tombs broke open and dead bodies stood up and began to walk. Now that, that sounds like a zombie movie, doesn't it? 
I mean, did you even know that's in the Bible? Did you know that that happened? Matthew says it happened. And if it happened, I'm wondering why the others didn't mention it. It's a pretty awesome experience. I can't explain it. I'll go ahead and let you know that. I can't explain it. Some scholars say that Matthew, at this point, is writing theology. He's, uh, he's giving us a glimpse of what the death of Jesus meant. It meant that death was defeated, and this is a pretty graphic way to illustrate that. Uh, some say that the period, and punctuation, of course, was not in the original. Maybe the period's in the wrong place. Look at verse 52. The tombs broke open, period. And then later, the bodies got up, and after the resurrection of Jesus, he came first. But after that, the saints of the ages will rise too. Maybe that's it. But that's even not the strangest thing in this account. What baffles me every time is the violence of the human heart. I'm never ready for that. I'm never prepared by violence. I'm always startled by it. When something like that happens, when people act this way, and, and toward none other than the sinless Son of God, Jesus, that's amazing to me. Albert Einstein, the great uh, theoretical physicist, never got a doctor's degree. Did you know that? I mean, you've got yours, but Einstein never got his. He said it was because nobody was ever qualified to give him one. <laughs> and I suppose that's true. I think about that when I look at this story and I see these religious leaders, these hypocrites, I see these soldiers, I, I see Pilate, I see all of them standing in judgment over Jesus. And I think, what audacity! that they could dare think they could judge him. There's an interesting question in chapter 27, verse 23. Jesus uh, is uh, before Pilate, and Pilate wants to let him go, but the crowd insists that he be crucified. Pilate asks this question, verse 23, Why? What crime has he committed? And some have said this is the second most important question you ever find in the Bible or even in all of human life. The, the most important question is, who is Jesus? You answer that and you're on your way. Who is Jesus? But the second question, so important, why? What did he do? Why would Jesus be treated this way? So to try to answer that, I want us today to go on a little trip together. I want us to... Uh, go back in time, 2,000 years. And I want us to go back to just outside Jerusalem, and I want us to stand together, all of us. I'll be the leader, but let's stand around the foot of the cross of Jesus. There weren't many disciples. One we know of, John, was there because Jesus is going to address him. The disciples had run. Mostly it was faithful women who were at the foot of the cross, but now we're going to join them. And what do we see? The first startling thing is darkness. Darkness descends at noon. They weren't expecting it. That's not the time. Was it an eclipse? Maybe so. We don't know. But suddenly, darkness descended. You know what that's like at your house when uh, you're watching television in the early evening, and suddenly the power goes out. And, and the house becomes dark, and you didn't see that coming. You didn't have candles ready, and you're stumbling around these people were used to executions. There were crosses everywhere. This uh, group of soldiers, this is what they did for a living. They, they did this every day, but never did the sky turn black. There's an earthquake, too, which was unexpected, as always. What's going on? Well, obviously, this is not an ordinary execution. Obviously, this is a cosmic event. Because what's going on right now, and they didn't realize it at the time, but what's going on right now is a great cosmic contest between good and evil. It all boils down to that place, that moment in time. Something's being settled here. Turn in your Bibles to Colossians. Just go over to uh, Colossians, right after Philippians. Colossians in chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. 
Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And if the most important question of all is, who is Jesus? Well, here's the answer to that question too. Chapter 1, verse 15. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created. Did you know that? It's by Jesus Christ that all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. If it is Christ who holds this universe together and he's being crucified, that's going to be felt throughout the universe. The sky turns black. But there's more darkness than that. When I stand at the foot of the cross and I look around and I, I see the soldiers and I hear the crowd with their jeers, I see the darkness of the human heart. You never see it more clearly than right here. The darkness of the human heart. I mean, such evil. Again, it always startles me. I don't expect to see it. Groups like ISIS that, that murder innocents, Boko Haram that, that steal little girls and take them away. Somebody standing on a ledge overlooking an overpass and threatening to jump and, and stopping traffic everywhere and people are out of their cars yelling, jump! I don't understand that. What kind of person does that? Where does it come from? Bertrand Russell was not a religious man, a British philosopher. He said, it is in our hearts that evil lies, and from our hearts that it must be plucked out. The Bible tells me this. I don't know what irreligious people say or how they explain it. It's a great mystery. How do you explain evil apart from something tragic in the heart. Jeremiah chapter 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's what the Bible says. Have you come to understand that about yourself? Not about anybody else, but about yourself. Do you see the sinfulness of your heart? We cannot be saved. We cannot be redeemed until we face that. But a lot of folks don't want to face it. They want to explain it away. They want to blame somebody else for their problems and everybody else's problems. Early in chapter 27, after Judas has betrayed Jesus, he was given money for it, you know, and now he's suddenly filled with remorse and he takes the money back to the religious leaders and he, he wants to give it back to them, but they won't take it. Look at chapter 27 and look at verse 4. What is it to us, they replied, that's your responsibility. Well, it's none of our business. You did it. It doesn't matter to us. And then later in the chapter, Pilate is standing there, and he washes his hands, the Scripture says, and he says, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. He wasn't innocent, but he's claiming innocence. Not my job, not my responsibility. It's all on you. The first step toward redemption is to see the darkness of the heart. But then I, I listen, and I hear a soul-shattering cry I did not expect to hear. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabbathani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You may recognize that as the first line of Psalm number 22. We know that in the first century, the Psalter, the, the book of Psalms, was the hymn book of believers. And so we know that Jesus sang these Psalms, and it is possible in this moment that he has been singing Psalm 22. But in this moment, he cries out in anguish. Jesus is suffering, but it's not physically suffering. That's the worst of it. Did you notice uh, when I was reading the account, the, the Scripture, how quickly it just says, and they crucified him. 
when you watch a movie about it, when you watch a television program about the death of Jesus, the emphasis is always on the, the physicality of it, the, the physical suffering of the nails and the spear and the crown of thorns. The, the New Testament doesn't emphasize that. I mean, it happened, but it talks about another kind of suffering, worse than physical suffering, because, you know, people suffer all the time. Martyrs to this day are giving their lives in some parts of the world, and they're dying horrific deaths. No, Jesus' death was different. It wasn't just the physical nature of it. It was the spiritual nature of it. He, he felt it in the garden when he said, My soul is, is suffering as unto death as he realized he was bearing the weight of the sins of all the world. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But, but it wasn't his will, and Jesus had to die. There was no plan B. There was no alternative. If we were to be set free, it would have to be by the death of Jesus. And so that day he cries out, My God, my God, why? You remember in the Godfather movies, the trilogy, The Godfather, the story of the Corleone family. Michael. Michael comes back from World War II, idealistic, a, a hero. He wants to live a good life, but quickly gets sucked into the family business and becomes a murderer himself and uh, thinks nothing of others as he consolidates his power. Well, when he comes to the end of it all, there's one person he loves, and that's his daughter. And at the end of the movie, they're coming out of the opera house in Rome and and an assassin fires and shoots Michael, wounds him, but kills the daughter. And in that scene, he's holding her. She's dead. He's holding her. And he opens his mouth wide and screams, but there's no sound. I mean, for the longest time, you just see his mouth open, and he's wailing, but there's, he can't make a sound. And finally, it comes from the very depth of him. I envision that when Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why? What's Jesus experiencing? Jesus in another place would say, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and yet here, God seems to be gone. You know, you've experienced that, haven't you? You believe that that God is with you. You believe He's always there. You believe it because the Bible tells you so. And yet you've had those moments too when you feel like He's nowhere around. No, He was there. God was right there suffering with His Son. Hear that cry from the Father's point of view. We, we, we hear it from Jesus' point of view, but hear it from the Father's point of view. You've had your child awaken in the night, maybe sick or, or maybe having had a nightmare, and, and that child cries out to you, and, and you, you jump and you rush because you don't want the child to think she's alone. You want to, them to know you are there. God is there with his son in that moment, in that cry of anguish. But let's leave the cross and let's move across town. There's a dark room in the temple complex and something happens there and nobody realizes at the time, but it's the most powerful thing in the story. In that darkened room, it was the holy place. It was the place where the high priest would go one time a year to meet with God on behalf of the people. Only one man, only one time a year, could go in there, and a thick curtain kept everybody else out. God's on the other side of that curtain, and, and you may not approach him. But in that moment, just as Jesus is dying, just as he, as he gives up the ghost, it is finished. In that little room across town, that curtain begins to tear. Not from the bottom to the top. Man would do that, but from the top to the bottom, because God is doing it. God is ripping open that curtain to let you know, to let me know that now, 
Now we can go right in. Now we're invited, sinners though we be, now we can go into the very presence of God. The, may, the way has been made clear. Salvation has been purchased. When Jesus said, it is finished, he meant I have paid the full price. Now everyone may come. Anyone who would repent of sin, anyone who would believe, you, you may come and have your sins forgiven. Now, this is glorious news. Quick, go, go run, tell Peter. Peter, last week we talked about how he denied the Lord three times, and he's, he's just torn up by it. He'll never forget it. Go tell him that now he can be forgiven because of what Jesus has done. And tell those soldiers, too. They heard Jesus say, Father, lay not this sin to their charge. They don't know what they're doing Tell the soldiers, though they wickedly crucified Jesus, they were doing their job. Tell them they can be forgiven if they will believe. We know Peter did. I think some of the soldiers did. Quick, run, tell Judas. Tell him that though he betrayed Jesus, he can be saved. No, it's too late for Judas because right after the soldier, the, the religious figures gave him back his money, they wouldn't take it. The Bible says he went out and hung himself. He, he didn't wait long enough to see God's great love and forgiveness. He could have been forgiven too, but he took his life. I want you to know today that God loves you, and it's not too late for you. Hear that word of redemption and reconciliation given to you. Elizabeth Barrett was the great uh, English poet. She was uh, writing poems as a teenager and, and becoming quite famous. She was also a semi-invalid from her teen years, and so led a pretty protected life. Sonnets of the Portuguese and, and all of that. Beautiful, beautiful work. Well, she met a man, Robert Browning, so she would become Elizabeth Barrett Browning. She married him, but she married him against her father's wishes. Her father didn't want her to marry anybody. Certainly not that guy. He forbade the marriage, so they had to elope. They, they skipped town. They got married, and they moved to Italy far, far away from home. And that's where she spent out the rest of her days. But every week, she wrote a letter to her father. Every week, she wrote a letter to her father and to her family, seeking reconciliation, seeking to make things right, seeking their understanding. But she never heard from them. Until one day, her father died, and sometime after that, a, a box arrived. And when she opened it, she saw all the letters she had sent to her father. None of them opened. They've gone on to become some of the, the classics of English literature. They are beautiful letters. But he never opened them. He never read them. What if, if only, how different the story would be I don't want it ever to be said of you, if only, if only you had heard God's love letter, if only you had opened it and read it and then opened your heart, what a difference it would have been for you. He loves you, and his death on the cross saves you if you will commit your way to him. I want you to do it today. Let's pray. Would you bow with me?